Hi, my name is Dr. Ross Hauser. Welcome to the Hauser Neck Center in Caring Medical Florida here in Fort Myers, Florida. This is part five of our series that I'm doing with my associate, Danielle Matis, uh, the other prolotherapist here at the Hauser Neck Center in Caring Medical Florida. If you ever wonder, geez, like who does Dr. Hauser's prolotherapy well? Danielle does Dr. Hauser's prolotherapy, and I can tell you assuredly that the prolotherapy she's done on me has made a major, major difference to the point where in about three or four weeks, I'm gonna do my first race in like 10 years. That's awesome. Uh, Mandy, Marion, and mm -hmm. I were scheduled to do a half marathon. Uh, Marion, who had a pelvic fracture in 2019, she never, ever thought she'd get back to running, and Mandy's never done a race, and of course, I'm the Sherpa, so my job, <laughs> my job is to have the backpack and just have all the stuff. And we did, uh, as you know, we had Hurricane Ian that we're all, you know, recovering from. So we did do a 10K on Saturday, and it went really, really well. And then we're supposed to do seven and a half miles uh, this uh, week. But our, our last session we wanted to do on the headaches was in regard to prolotherapy. So just to recap. Mm -hmm. Uh, Danielle, what would you say, like say, you know, like you said, headaches are kind of ubiquitous. So what would make somebody think maybe the headaches from the neck? That's a good question because we get a lot of inquiries about headaches. People will, that have a neck um, related headache will often tell me that quite simply their neck hurts when they get a headache or they get a lot of muscle tightness um, in their neck as related to a headache or their neck clicks, pops, um, snaps, crunches. Some people will even say, if I click my neck, that actually helps relieve my headache. Uh, those are kind of common things that we'll hear with neck related headaches. I just wanted to, you were saying that there's something we didn't mention in our five videos and you and I actually have very few We've, I'm not even sure we've ever talked about this, but there's a thing called the myodural bridge. I just want to explain it. So, you know, it's really, really common where people say real high up, it just kills them. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many people jam in there. So there's basically in human beings, there's this connection between the suboccipital muscles and the dura. So the dura, you know, that's the yeah. covering of the spinal cord and the brain. So there is, so in other words, if you have cervical instability through many of our videos, you know that there's the ligament muscular reflex. Mm -hmm. So the muscles clamp down back here. So the atlas and the different vertebrae don't smash on the spinal cord and this or that. So the muscles clamp down, that tightens the myodural bridge, which is the connection like a fibrous tissue, mm -hmm. connective tissue between the muscles and the dura. It yanks on the dura. And that, of course, can just give you unbelievable pain because that's the uh, covering of the brain and the spinal cord. That's just another thing that can cause can cause headaches. Um, interesting too is I just did a video which uh, Izzy was there. Well, you, you you heard the tail end, and it was just that they did a study and they showed that as the emissary vein, so we always talk about the jugular vein, jugular vein, jugular vein, because of course if the jugular vein gets compressed, the brain volume goes up, the fluid goes up, gives you a terrible headache. So they did this study where they put a stint like to open up the mm -hmm. vein. It was basically the veins inside the brain. Okay. But So the veins drain better, the emissary vein diameter went down and that correlated with headache relief. Interesting. So that's, yeah, that's just, you know, so the bottom line is there definitely is research that if you open up the veins and the, yeah, the head pressure, the headache will go down. So how would we diagnose if somebody says that if somebody has cervical instability? So there's somebody who's thinking that they might have cervical instability then. So there's a specific imaging uh, called a digital motion x-ray that we typically start with, which is an x-ray movie. So we can actually see what's happening to your vertebrae and the position of your vertebrae and your curve and what happens when you lean forward, look up, rotate to the side and so forth. So very different than a static x-ray where you're just holding still. We can also do a cone beam CT scan to look at vertebral position and even ultrasounds of the jugular veins, carotid arteries, things like that to just kind of get a whole picture on 
is your neck unstable? How unstable is it? And then what are the consequences of that in all the structures of your neck? How many times, think of what I'm gonna say, how many times have you had a patient come in because another doctor either said they have joint instability or they have a ligament damage? It's, I could probably count it on one that's hand. That's what I mean, yeah, it's like yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like crazy, it's almost like Modern medicine forgets about ligaments. So yeah. just to go over, what does a ligament do? So ligaments are essentially rubber bands, as, as I describe them, that hold all of our vertebrae together. So like every bone in your body is connected to the one next to it by a ligament or a series of ligaments that you know is created stability so that you know your your skeleton holds strong. And then to induce a ligament to repair, because you know, people have a lot of muscle injuries and da da da, sure. and you get physical therapy and da da da. Why does somebody have to resort to this, and why did the body not repair the ligament, or why didn't physical therapy not work? Or I get this question all yeah, the yeah. time. Like I talk about this with almost all new patients. So when somebody has a muscle injury, like you're exactly right. Like they go to physical therapy, you know, time, whatnot. It takes care of it. I mean, how often do we see muscle injuries in our office? Yeah, like, almost zero. Mostly never. So yeah. when people have a ligament injury, they've done, most of the studies they've done on this are in like knees and ankles, like you sprain your ankle. Um, so you've injured the ligaments, you've stretched it out. You've gone from, let's say, 100% strength in your ligament to, you know, after the body repairs it, maybe you're down to 80, 85%. And that might be enough. You know, your ligament heals to 80%. You can still do what you want to do, but then you sprain your ankle again. Now you're down to like 60% healing. And then it just kind of goes on and on. Like the body just with ligament injuries, you're more prone to more injuries and you just can't heal it to 100% in a lot of the cases. And you can do all the exercise in the world. There's just no exercise that strengthens ligament tissue. The only thing that does is prolotherapy. Yeah, you actually have to take, like this is just the needle going down where the ligament is and you're actually stimulating the cells to uh, yeah. proliferate. Here, this is the animation that we made like 10, 12 years ago. And it really does illustrate like when you look down, especially if you look down a long time, basically what can happen is the ligaments can get stretched out and the uh, movement of bones doesn't lie. So obviously if this bone is moving too much and hitting this nerve, it means that the connection here is not holding. So just like a screw on a hinge, a screw, mm -hmm. there's no other treatment, you gotta tighten the screw. Yeah. So if you have a loose ligament, you have to tighten the ligament. And the problem is if this bone's moving too much, it's gonna cause yep. that bone to move too much. So the video here is then gonna show prolotherapy. If you could just describe you know, what prolotherapy is or when you're doing prolotherapy in the neck. Yeah, so prolotherapy, is basically an injection technique that's used to stimulate repair. So we do injections into these ligament tissues and with the goal of irritating the tissue to some degree to get your body to send growth factors and cells and platelets to the area to heal it and tighten it up. And so like what you touched on is if let's say you start, you know, you have one ligament injury in your neck, it is a progressive disorder. It typically does not get better on its own. It gets worse over time and spreads to to multiple levels in the neck or, or the low back or wherever. And then you could tell whether it's working or not by doing a repeat yep. digital motion x-ray. So that's like excellent because then you have objective. Yeah. And then how many prolotherapy treatments do you do before you rescan them? Usually like we'll do um, like our set of scans at the first initial visit, do three treatments and then we'll kind of rescan. Sometimes we'll do four. So this patient is obviously laying face down. There's the back of the patient's head. And then this is my ultrasound probe here. And so I do have an, like my ultrasound screen. And so I'm looking, you know, where, where the joints are, where the ligaments are. Also as importantly as where are the blood vessels and so forth to avoid. And then I'm doing injections guided with the ultrasound into the cervical spine. So you can see I, can, I found my place and then I'm gonna move down. I'm gonna find the next structure once I find it and then we're gonna treat that one. And you're hitting bone? Yep, and we hit bone. We hit the ligament attachments to the bone. That's the main target. Yep. And you can just gonna see, I'll just use it as I march my way down on the neck. In this patient, you know, we did a whole neck treatment on both sides. There we go. Why at Caring Medical do we tend to be 
you know, what we term comprehensive, like doing the whole neck, like even if a digital motion x-ray maybe just shows, you know, three or four segments loose, we might do all of the segments. Like, why do we do that? Or, you know, in the simplest form, I mean, we get really, really good results when we're comprehensive. And instead of just treating like an individual ligament, really treating that whole body area as a whole unit to kind of rebuild works very well. Sometimes in a digital motion x-ray, and you kind of correct me if I um, am saying this wrong, but we'll definitely see segments where there's um, instability, but some segments actually may not move as much as like a compensation type of factor. So I do still like to treat those because they are still pain generators. Because almost always, you know, when you examine people, they're tender here, they're tender here, oh, yeah. they're tender here. Because they could even say, I'm just telling you, doc, I got cracking here. But when we do the digital motion x-ray, you could have muscle spasm there and you don't even see instability. Yeah. So um, it's kind of like when you go to a physical therapist or a trainer, they're not just going to do ab workout because it's not going to be bad for you to get all your muscles of your body yeah. strong yeah. versus... Now it seems like sometimes you're going more medial and then other times you're going more lateral. So why is that? So they're just kind of depending on the structure that you want to hit. Plus the capsular ligaments, you know, just treating them, you know, kind of several times along the length or, you know, along the width of the ligament provides really good results. And then of course, at the different locations, you're hitting different ligaments. Correct. Mm -hmm. So most like on the, kind of on the side are the capsular ligaments at the facet joints, but then in other cases, you know, the spinous processes um, and even some of the muscle and uh, tendon attachments on the occiput as well. There's two ways to do prolotherapy. Like one is image guided and anatomy guided. So you'll see me here where my fingers are on the spinous processes so I know where the midline is. And just like you, you know, I'm going to hit the facet joints and I'm going to hit the transverse processes. And then because the vertebral artery is really high up, then, you know, you'll see me use guidance. Um, if you put a person in a certain position and you have the angle of the needle a certain way, it's actually a very safe procedure. And what I tell people is for 50 different times we went from Chicago to the charity clinic in rural Illinois. Mm -hmm. And we treated anywhere from 300 to 500 patients in this church, the First Baptist Church of Thieves. You could Google mm -hmm. it and it's still there. And during the 50 clinics, each clinic we saw, you know, 300 to 500 patients. And the amount of times in this rural town that we called an ambulance was zero. Wow. So I'm not saying 100%, but geez, if Doc's doing these kind of shots, mm -hmm. no guidance, no nothing, you know, if, you, if you're an expert at it, it actually is a very, very safe procedure. So, and you could see the person does have nitrous mm -hmm. oxide. So what would you say is the percentage of your patients that you're treating, they need like some medication or they need? Um, I would say maybe 30%. Okay, and then you, you numb it or you don't numb it? I will numb it if I do PRP. Okay. So if we do platelet-rich plasma, just because the blood product is a little bit thicker, right. I would numb it. Just but because is, it's more painful. It is more painful would, okay. to inject without numbing, but there is numbing in our normal um, mm. dextrose syringes, so they do get numbing. Common question, like, when do you use PRP versus regular prolotherapy solutions? So what do you, yeah. you know, for headaches or neck pain patients, what do you? That, so with necks, um, be, because we know that dextrose works so well on ligaments, I would say in majority of the neck cases I treat, if we end up doing PRP, I don't usually always start with that. You know, we typically start with aggressive dextrose prolotherapy. Um, and we kind of keep PRP as a, as a plan B, or if they tolerate the dextrose well, we can add the PRP in next time. If somebody though has, I would say pretty severe instability, like if, you know, C4, C5, like if it's sliding off and, and their pain is terrible, I might consider using it as a first line treatment. But typically for next, I use it kind of more second line. How about you? Well, it's similar to you. The only thing I would add is like if somebody had really bad occipital neuralgia, you know, they, in yeah, order they, they, 
you, you just know the nerve got shellacked a thousand times. Right. Like if there's a nerve component that's the primary pathology of the headache or the pain versus like a muscle problem. Mm -hmm. So they have instability, it's stretching and compressing a nerve and that's like causing the pain. Yeah. I feel that the nerve probably needs repair too. So the nerve can repair by itself if you get rid of the stretch and compression by doing curve correction mm -hmm. and prolotherapy. But there just are times where you just gotta put a little bit of PRP yeah. around the nerve to stimulate the nerve repair. I just wanted to show this too. So this would be what you or I do mm -hmm. when we do upper cervical injection. So why don't you describe? Yeah, so if we look here, this is the base of the skull, and then this is actually C1. You just saw um, fluid actually injected there. And then as you go down the spine, you know, C2 to C7. So we're looking here for um, the actual joint, like the position of C1 and so forth, and then for blood vessels to obviously make sure that we avoid hitting them. So that's where ultrasound guidance, especially in that upper cervical part, is, upper cervical part, excuse me, is very handy. So we can actually even use ultrasound uh, with Doppler to look at fluid. That's actually how you can see blood vessels because you'll see fluid moving. But if you look here, all that right there is actually the fluid that you're injecting. And we just can use that even as further confirmation that we're in the right spot. Now, obviously a common question is like, when should I see you next? You know, the patient asks. So how do you determine how frequently a person should be seen and then how do you determine how many visits of prolotherapy if somebody has really bad head pressure or headaches? Most typically we see patients about once a month even for necks I would say kind of in the once every four to six weeks. Now sometimes if somebody has like very severe or more significant instability um, that's significantly affecting their lifestyle we could tailor that to maybe every two weeks or if someone is doing prolotherapy, but they're really doing a lot of curve correction, you know, we might space it out a little bit more so they can work on their curve. So that is, I would say, very tailored to the patient, but most often it's about once a month. And the number of treatments really depends on how unstable their neck is. Someone that has a little bit of neck instability, it's very minor, you know, they likely aren't gonna need 10 neck treatments. Maybe we do, you know, three or four, and they work on their curve or, or not, depending on how it looks. Someone with very severe neck instability, it could be eight to 10 treatments to resolve yeah. it. I think that's, I like that because we do let people know right from the get-go. Yeah. And then, is there anything a person has to do beside prolotherapy to get better? I tell patients, I know you do too, like it's not completely up to us. You know, we're definitely a part in it and getting their healing, but a lot of it is up to them. A healthy lifestyle is huge. Patients that get their neck treated, this is true for, for all body areas, and they go home, um, this is the analogy I use all the time, if all you do is eat Cheetos and drink Dr. Pepper and smoke all day, you're not gonna get better, you know, you're not gonna heal well versus someone that has a healthier lifestyle. Same thing with activity. We don't want someone with a neck treatment to just be hunched over their phone all day. Do things to actively work on your neck curve and keep yourself active and healthy in a way though that's not too much. Yeah, it's well said. One last thing I do want to say about headaches, I read this in an article somewhere that it is normal or like a, a normal average person gets two headaches a year. Okay. Like that's actually in the realm of normal, but so many people that we see, I mean, some people get headaches every day, mm -hmm. you know? So if you're somebody that is getting, you know, constant frequent headaches and this sounds like this might apply to you, uh, reach out. We'd love to hear from you.